Hi, my name is Jared Martin and this video was created to delve into a cold water species of saltwater fish that is very near and dear to me personally, the Atlantic cod or Gaddis morhua. To start off the discussion on economically relevant commercial fish, it is only in fitting to begin with the species that was so prevalent along the coast of Massachusetts that the region is aptly named after it. As you can see, its appearance is marked by a notable lateral line on the side. The pictures that I observed through iNaturalist were focused on fish catches by civilians, which is pretty fitting for considering how this species has fared over the past couple of centuries. Atlantic cod have a relatively expansive natural range, notably in the northern hemisphere, due to their appreciation of colder waters. This is due in part to the phenomenon of broadcast spawning, during which both sperm and egg are dispersed throughout the deeper waters of the Atlantic Ocean. This is a method of external fertilization that requires the sperm and egg to create a zygote, and it is commonly practiced across aquatic invertebrates. Each population of cod is commonly referred to as a stock, and different stock regions can be seen in the diagram shown, including the Northeast Arctic cod above Russia and Norway, as well as along the Northeastern American seaboard. Note that these listed areas are obviously not the only populations of cod globally, but are just examples. The Kattegat stock is unique in that it is able to live in waters with lower than normal salinity, closer to brackish water than the typical concentrations that Atlantic cod usually live in. As for the relevance of the species size, one report by the U.S. Department of Commerce explained that the larger members of the cod school are considered the scouting leaders for the rest of the group. This information suggested that relative size of the fish is essential for its migration patterns and continued longevity. Further, if an artificial selection imposed by humans was introduced, such as through a fishing size regulation, this could influence school migrations as a whole. Here we can see a comparison of 1850 and 2005 Atlantic cod densities along the northwestern Atlantic coast, specifically in the U.S. and Canada. Of course, anthropogenic influences such as technological fishing advances, coupled with the increased human consumption, led to gratuitous overfishing of the species to the point of a vulnerable conservation status. However, not all stocks are declining or recovering at the same rate. This could be due in part to lingering gray seal populations which are thriving in the Gulf of Maine area, specifically on the Eastern Scotian Shelf, or ESS. Some stocks, such as the Barents Sea, have experienced a more favorable response to fishing overhauls, which we will be discussing later. The devastation to cod species can be categorized as ecological and evolutionary in terms of the impacts on climate change. Of course, with increased output of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, there is an increase in absorbance in the ocean, leading to increased ocean temperatures, which has a necessary shift in the range of Atlantic cod to compensate. This ecological shift is evident in terrestrial and aquatic organisms alike, but has particular significance in this species because of its commercial relevance. In addition, the, pres the presence of increased ocean acidification led to a multitude of issues, problematic not only for vestibular and respiratory development, such as in the balance and gill functions of the fish, but also for larval development as well. This is important because with decreased viability, there will be decreased longevity and an inability for population growth to boom as a result in the future. Further, the impact on shell calcification of crustaceans, part of the cod's food source, could only detriment all parties involved. As for evolutionary impacts, there is a directional selection based on size restrictions when fishing, the direction of which favoring small individuals resulting in a higher fitness for them. However, one model observed that this factor was less relevant in situations where density-dependent growth was present. In the visual to the left, there are two curved trend lines featuring the impacts of carbon dioxide in water bodies and its relative effect on cod survival. As expected, populations with higher carbon dioxide experience decreased survivability as compared to those with ambient or typical levels in the environment. The other visual to the right shows the clear decrease of fish catch, specifically along the Gulf of Maine stock, 
measured in metric tons. The visual to the right shows successful regeneration of the Barents cod population over time, represented by a general increasing SSB responding stock biomass. This is the mass of fish that can reproduce successfully and carry on the population growth for future generations. This success story is most likely a combination of luck and successful climate change mitigation and adaptation. I say this because the increasing ambient temperature in the region most likely increase the region for the stock to populate, causing for less competition, demonstrating a density dependent growth situation. Although there isn't much positivity associated with this story, there can be a small glimmer of hope, especially for these struggling cod sucks throughout the Northwestern Atlantic. This can be seen through the increased prevalence of great white sharks in the Gulf of Maine area, which could decrease gray seal populations over time, which, in turn, would lead to a greater availability for this specific stock population to boom as intended. <laughs>